Hey friends, Pastor Kerry with Growing in the Gospel. Welcome back. Today we're going to talk about Thanksgiving and we're going to talk about the fact that we have some things to be thankful for that we don't even know about yet. We haven't even realized yet. And so call it faith thanks, call it anticipatory thanks, call it just knowing that God is better than we can possibly imagine giving thanks, you know, kind of thanks. But hang with me. The next few minutes, I think, will encourage you. This is Growing in the Gospel. And on the channel, we're doing a number of things. The One Year Bible Journey, the Gospel of John. We started a new series uh, called Healthy Church, 10 Values that Sustain a Kingdom, a Thriving Kingdom Community. And so I hope you will dial into that. Uh, First message went live last Sunday. So I hope that you will track all of these things or any of them that you can and let this channel be a blessing to you. If you're new, I hope you'll stick around, invite some friends to join us on this journey. On Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, we're slow walking through the Psalms. And I'm very excited that we get to introduce today a new Psalm, and that is Psalm 138. So we're pressing in close to the end of Psalms. And um, this is a transition from where we've been to a set of eight Psalms that are Psalms of David, and they're they're all celebratory, praise, thanksgiving kinds of psalms. And particularly this psalm is about, about God answering prayer, keeping his promises. And so let's just take a few minutes, and like we do always when we introduce a new psalm, we pretty much read it, uh, comment, make a few comments. I think I'm going to try to cover verses 1, 2, and 3 today. And then we'll do four and five in tomorrow's video and six, seven, and eight in Friday's video. So 138, beginning in verse one, this is a Psalm of King David. I will praise thee with my whole heart. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise thee, O Lord, when they hear the words of thy mouth. Yea, they shall sing in the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, Yet hath he respect unto the lowly. But the proud he knoweth afar off. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, thou wilt revive me. Thou shalt stretch forth thine hand against the wrath of mine enemies, and thy right hand shall save me. The Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the words of thine own hands. Oh my goodness, what a powerful eight verses we have to think about these next few days. And, you know, I say this about every part of Scripture. This has just become immediately the last few moments one of my favorite Psalms. (laughs) So uh, I'm kind of with the Bible like I am with food. You say, what's your favorite food? Whatever I'm eating next. Um, So anyway, Psalm 138, let's go back and let's work our way through verses 1, 2, and 3 and just meditate and kind of muse on this for a minute. It's obviously a celebratory psalm. It's obviously a psalm that is coming out of good things that God has done, and yet not entirely out of touch with trouble. Verse 7, David says he walks in the midst of trouble. So this is a celebratory song, but it's not delusional. It's very much, it's not naive. It's very much in touch with the -the on-the-ground reality of the trouble of our lives, but also very much in touch with the overarching power, presence, and promises and goodness of God. So David says, he's making a decision in verse 1, I will praise thee with my whole heart. This idea of praise is worship and celebration and enjoyment. It is, it's, it is overflowing. It's gushing with love for God and celebration of who he is and what he's done. And David says, I'm going to pour my whole heart and my whole self into this. I want to comment here that all God really is looking for is your heart. Your performance won't measure up. Your achievements don't matter. He doesn't need, well, let me back up. Your achievements in his grace and by his purposes, they matter. That you, you got to kind of parse what I'm saying here. 
He doesn't need our achievements to make him complete. He does not uh, need our rituals or our traditions or our religiosity. He wants and has pursued from the very beginning a family. He has pursued a relationship with humanity. He has pursued a kingdom, covenant, family relationship that was lost at creation and reclaimed through Jesus in the plan of redemption. And anyone who will have him can have him and he can be adopted into his family and he makes our hearts new. And what God wants is a heart-based, a love-based, a genuine relationship, not us jumping through hoops, not us faking it or hiding or pretending that we're better than we are. No, God knows exactly who we are, but he wants us. He wants our hearts. He wants our love, and he's deserving of our love. And our love is a responsive love. We, we, we didn't make the first move. He loved us first. We love him because he first loved us, and his love compels. It, it prompts. It spurs on a return love. This is what the gospel produces. And that return love is a transformational force that's working in our lives. So David says, God, I'm going to praise you and I'm going to give it my whole heart because I want you to have my whole heart. When God indicted Israel, uh, they were going through religious things. Isaiah chapter one is one place where he does this. They were going through ritualistic religious things and doing what God said to do. But he said, Stop. Stop your offering. Stop your feast. Stop your celebrations. They're not meaningful because your heart is far from me. You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far away from me. And so God wants our whole hearts. This next phrase, David is glorying, he's exalting that he belongs to the one true God. Before the gods will I sing praise unto thee. So what is the sense of this? Well, there's a couple possibilities. Um, It could be Elohim, that Hebrew word often refers to heavenly beings. I don't think that's what it is, but he might be looking forward to heaven and singing before uh, the divine council and and all these angelic beings. Um, That's the lowercase g gods can sometimes refer to those beings of authority, heavenly authority. Um, Lesser beings, understand there's one true God, one most high God, capital E Elohim, capital G God, okay? Okay. The second option is that David is talking about the gods and the false uh, systems, the the idols and the kings and leaders of the enemies of God surrounding their nation, that God's given him victory as a king and given him peace in his kingdom and strength and prosperity. And so he is going to exalt God to the neighbors and to the the pagan kings and, and in their pagan systems. The third I, I'm, I'm in favor of that one, by the way. Um, the third one could be that uh, he is talking about actual satanic fallen a- angelic beings um, that are in the spirit realm, in the invisible realm, and that um, that the kingdom of Christ will triumph ultimately and finally uh, after the great tribulation over all of those uh, powers and that. Uh, and those are sometimes uh, those are sometimes called Elohim or, or lowercase g gods. So, and you know what? Option number four is it could be all those. It could be all those things. And when you look at the layout of Scripture, it probably is all of the above. But in David's original context and thought, he's probably talking about those surrounding pagan nations and their pagan deities. So what all he's saying is, God, you are the Most High, and all everything else bows before you. Verse two. I will worship toward thy holy temple. So worship is to bow before in reverence with with honor and respect. Praise is sort of the celebratory emotion and worship is sort of the love, reverential awe emotion and sometimes they go together. Toward thy holy temple is acknowledging the presence of God. Um, And in David's lifetime, there was not a temple. There was a tabernacle and there was the location of a future temple. Uh, so again, maybe David's living in the future there, um, but but he is bent on focusing on the presence and the person of God. Now we today are the temple, okay? We are God's temple. His spirit lives in us. So David is, is essentially acknowledging the presence of God. And I'll praise thy name for thy loving kindness and thy truth. I want you to see this, love and truth, truth and love. Jesus was the perfect embodiment of truth and love. 
And these, th- these two things go together. Truth is objective reality, and love is the compassion and mercy that we receive in light of the truth. Love never is in conflict with truth. Love never ignores truth. Love flows really out of truth, genuine love. If it's not based in truth, it's not real love, and it's not loving. And, and they go together in this way. You don't, you don't want truth that isn't loving because that's just going to crush you. The truth is I am sinful. The truth is I deserve judgment, condemnation. The truth is I deserve to go to hell. That's the truth. The truth at the first position, the truth crushes me. But love and, and mercy and loving kindness comes in and says, but here's the other truth. Jesus died and rose again. Jesus is a savior. Jesus is a suffering servant. Jesus is then offering a sacrifice for sin. He's the atonement, the propitiation, the lamb that was slain. So anybody that receives him comes into, is rescued from hard truth into gentle truth, uh, uh, receptive love, grace, mercy. That That is equally true. And so in that I can receive the love of God. So Truth and love, they go together, they pair together, and God calls us to be the embodiment of truth in love and to speak truth lovingly and to be loving people. Um, and you can't really separate them. To not speak the truth is not loving, and, um, and truth without love is just a stick to beat people with. And both uh, extremes misrepresent the heart of God because God is truth but he is love. And those two qualities are inseparable when it comes to the nature and heart and character of God. So David says, I'm praising and celebrating the fact that you are loving and you are truth. And I am welcomed into your presence in light of those two realities. But look at this next phrase. This is interesting. For thou hast magnified thy word above thy name. What does that mean? Um, Does it mean that God's word is more valuable than his name? That's impossible. Okay, that can't it can't be that his word is more valuable than his name because they are they're one and the same, essentially. Okay, his name is his his name resulted in his word and his word is dependent on his name, his reputation, his integrity, his identity, his uh, character quality. Okay, he's absolutely holy. So his name is who he is. His word is what flows out of his name. So it's really not David saying one is more important than the other or one is more valuable than the other. Um, so let's do a little bit of a, let's do a little bit of search on this for a minute. Okay. So um, if I take this, this is how I study the Bible, by the way. So I've always been taught that when when David said you uh, have, have elevated or you've magnified your word above your name, that's always been sort of a defense mechanism for defending the word of God, which by the way, needs no defense, but you know, as though somehow, um, there's a literal sense to which the word of God is more valuable than the name of God. But if you think of that rationally and logis- and logically it like that's incoherent. Okay. So let's go look at what some, a couple of other, uh, English, modern English translations say. Um, so ESV, you have exalted above all things, your name, and your word. That's interesting. Okay. Um, or an alternate rent rendering is, or you have exalted your word above all your names. So either way, okay. In the Hebrew construct, either way is correct. Verse two, I'm sorry. Uh, no, sorry. Let's go NLT. Um, for your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. Interesting. Okay. Let's go to NASB. For thou hast magnified thy word according to all thy name. And um, their footnote on word is promise. And their footnote on according to is together with. Okay. So again, Hebrew language is very conceptual. So is it that any of these translations got it wrong? No. Um, In fact, they're all accurate representations of the Hebrew construct. And so in that sense, they're all correct. Um, But I tell you what I like um, that really to me flows. A big question you have to ask when you're talking about something like this is you have to ask, what is the context of the, what is this Psalm actually saying in big picture? What is David trying to get across? David's trying to get across that God has done more for him than he imagined and then he prayed for. Okay. Um, 
I called this psalm, I called this devotion today, God's reality exceeds his reputation, okay? Um, and this is the essence of what this means. And I love what um, Warren Wearsby in his B-series book says about this particular verse. He says, the meaning, a modern paraphrase, seems to be, I trusted your promises and prayed, and the Lord answered above and beyond anything that he promised. Okay, so let's go back and let's look at the let's look at the text, okay? So again, I don't I don't think that um I'm not saying that this translation is wrong. I, I'm saying it's easy to misunderstand. Okay. And we as diligent students like Berean Christians, we need to examine and study and seek to understand the context and the flow and the and the, the idea thought flow. Okay. So David says, I'm going to praise you with my whole heart, praise you in front of all the gods. I'm going to worship towards your holy temple because of your truth and your love. You've magnified your word above your name. Okay, you've magnified your promises above your name, your reputation. Look at verse three. In the day when I cried, thou answerest me and strengthenest me with the strength in my soul. So David is exalting and celebrating the fact that God, okay, magnified, exploded the word, the fulfilled word, the fulfilled promises more than his name. Okay, what is the, what is the idea here? The, the practical flowing idea is, God, my experience of your fulfilled promises your word as it came true in my life was better and bigger than your preceding reputation would have indicated. That's why I said in the title, God's reality exceeds his reputation. And this is why I said in the beginning of the devotion that we have more to thank God for than we realize. Okay. Because here's what David is saying. You've magnified your word above your name. You have fulfilled your promises in bigger supersized, you've supersized your promises more than your reputation would have um, caused us to, to imagine. This goes very well with the verse that says, it hasn't entered into the heart of man. We can't possibly imagine all that God has prepared for them that love him. It also goes well with Ephesians three nineteen through 20, which says, to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God, now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The New Testament backs this phrase up with this idea. God's fulfilled blessings and promises in your life are going to exceed what you know right now and what you imagine he will do. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Do you get it? This is what David is saying. God, when your promises came true, they were far better. Your word, as it was materialized, it was far bigger and far better than your name and your reputation preceding you. Okay, what does that mean for me and you? It means there's a lot of things we have to thank God for and celebrate right now than we could possibly imagine. We, we have never imagined how great and how good his goodness is and how vast, how supersized it is. Verse three, in the day when I cried. So there was this needy moment, this trial, this hardship, this vulnerability, this moment. I cried, you answered me, and you strengthened me with strength in my soul. God, I prayed, I needed strength. You answered me, you gave me strength. You undergirded my soul. David is celebrating this. You can celebrate this too. God has already put strength in reserve for you to claim in prayer. God will answer that prayer. He will continue to lead you forward. You can celebrate what he has not yet done. You can anticipate it and you can be guaranteed, guaranteed 100% that when God's promises come true in your life, they will exceed what you ever thought they would. That is the essence of this wonderful, wonderful promise filling psalm so 
we're just beginning. Psalm 138 is pretty good already, isn't it? Man, I love the Bible. I love God. I love sharing this stuff with you. And I'm so thankful you let me talk to you today about this stuff. Um, Love your comments. So drop a comment or a question or a prayer request. Uh, Thank you for being a part of the family. Stick around if you're new and we'll pick it up here tomorrow. I'm praying for you all. Have a great day.